Lord, listen to your children pray. Lost in your spirit in this place. Hey, y'all. Uh, today we're going into um, another part of the resurrection story. It's a great story here, and it is talking. We are teaching out of Isaiah chapter 53. Then you have to go to Luke chapter 24. Now, let me warn you all, I've got to go into some really hard teaching here because I've got to try to figure out what are the stripes. Uh, and by his stripes, we were healed. By his stripes, we are healed. And by his stripes, we were healed. We do see that in two different places, but, you know, that's cats and mouses, apples and oranges. But which healing is this? By his stripes, we were healed. Is that bodily healing, physical healing? Or is that spiritual healing? I tend to believe it's a spiritual healing. And I'm going to tell you why I believe that in about 60. You're good. You're good. You're good. You're good. Don't stop it. Bass. It's the show that will get you thinking. And where the topics are hot. Feel free to comment whether we agree or not. Cause he's got something to say. Sir Walter Jones. Sir Walter Jones. He's got something to say. Sir Walter Jones. Sir Walter Jones. Reporting live seven days a week. Always on time, but it's time is not free. So watch the Jones, always on sleep. Latest trending topics had you jumping out your seat. He's got something to say. Come on in. The water's fine. Hello, everybody. So watch the So Walter Jones show. I'm here. It is the evening, the weekend edition, baby. <laughs> Come on in, the water's fine, water's fine. Y'all all right out there? Bunkers, y'all doing good. It's good. Tiffany, uh, the enlightened, I like that, and I like that. Oh, shucks. Well, today you're my favorite commenter. How about that? Thank you. Bernie and, and uh, Williams is here, and AJ Baby Girl, Drea is here, Monica Kincaid. So many of you are here. Thank you all for coming to the show. Renee and, and uh, Tina Moore, all my, my dear friends. Uh, Isaiah 53, 5 through 8. It starts off, <clears throat> and then it goes into Luke chapter 24. Y'all ready for this teaching? My brother Rodney and I, for many years, disagreed with each other on this subject matter. Um, he, myself, and my brother Larry went out to breakfast brunch today, as we typically do every, every few weeks. And um, I discussed this with him. I said, do you still believe that? He said, well, I, no, I, I believe it's both spiritual and uh, physical. And I told him, <clears throat> told him, you're right. It is based off of the Hebrew word that's used in Isaiah 53. But here's the problem. <clears throat> Ella Jones, you just did a show on context, context, context. <laughs> Don't nobody talk. Don't nobody tag him. Don't nobody tag him. You just did a show on context, context, context. And in the context in which I'm going to read, I see not physical healing. I see spiritual healing. Here's the thing. The reason why I'm leaning on spiritual healing is, number one, because of the context we see in 1 Peter and in, in Isaiah 53, which we're going to read. And number two, which would you prefer? Come close. <laughs> Somebody said, if you say come close, come close. Which would you prefer? Would you prefer healing of the body or would you prefer spiritual healing? Hmm? Which one do you think is more important? Which one leans, leans more towards the purpose of God taking his son and allow him to die on that cross. Hmm? Which one? You, you, can't, you can't get them both, Joyce Fraser, <laughs> Joyce Church Turner. You can't get them both. Can't get them both. Which one? Which one? Hmm? Hmm? 
uh, because there are many people in the Lord saved, sanctified, Holy Ghost filled, fire baptized, and they're still physically sick. So by his stripes, we are and were healed, but yet many of you are still sick. Hmm? So this might be my personal analogy of uh, Isaiah 53, but I'm also going to show maybe some of the commentaries to see what they have to say, because some of them did disagree with each other, but most of them, I think, might be lining up with what I'm saying here. Y'all understand? Come on, y'all. Patricia, come on. I see you. Who, now, I'm reading this in the NLT, so it may not sound as familiar as King James. Who has believed our, our message or our report and to whom has a, uh, let me see. Does it start? Where does it start, you all? Is it start at one or the start? Where does the lesson start? I didn't put it on the, um, I think it starts at five. Yeah, it starts at five. Well, let's, let's, let's start at the, the beginning. My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance. Y'all always making him so pretty. <laughs> okay. Nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way, and he was despised, and we did not care. Now, this is his own people, because unto us a child is born. These were the Jews. Jesus was not born uh, among us. He was born among them. They gave him to us as a gift. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, um, yet it was our weaknesses he carried. Our weaknesses he carried, it was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. Look at this. We thought his, his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. Have y'all ever seen that before? You probably hadn't seen it like, like that before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But he was but... Now, you see, you can't start off with the but. You can't start off with a conjunction, junction, what's your function? A natural healing is good for this life. Spiritual healing is good for the life and for our everlasting life. Come on, Deatra, D to the cartel. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so, come on, Tiffany. Come on, Tiff. Tiff, Tiff, you my, you my new favorite today. <laughs> you my new favorite. Hit that like button. So then after he said all of that, he says, but he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All right. So let's do this. Uh, Rogers, if you would put, okay, uh, I was going to ask you to put it on the screen, and there it is. All right, um, I need to read it in the King James. Thank you for that. So that you could, so that it can sound like something that sounds familiar to you. But he was wounded for our transgressions; he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace were upon him, and by his stripes we were healed, or we are healed. All right, let's see if we can uh, unpack this. Where do I go first? Well, we have to go to Bible Hub to see if we could start at the beginning. Start all over again. Start all over Again, this time. All right, right here. Where is it? Okay, can I do this without screwing up? All right, I'm I'm I'm, I'm up here somewhere. Hold on. How long? How do I do this? Uh, okay, let me shrink myself. Let me shrink myself. The incredible shrinking man. Put me in the corner there. Put me in the corner. Put me in a flat. <laughs> okay. King James says, 
but he was wounded. Okay. So I think we need to focus on a word here for he was pierced for our transgression. No, let me go back to King James for he was wounded for our transgression for he was bruised for our iniquities. Just made of a peace upon him by his stripes. Here's the word here in question stripes. We are healed. Let's see if anybody else says stripes. Okay. Here English standard says wounds. I agree with wounds, stripes, wounds. I agree with wounds instead of stripes by his scourging. I agree with scourging instead of stripes scourging. Y'all see what's happening here. Mm -hmm. uh, wounds is better. Punishment of his for stripes and liquid liquid uh, amplified dead. If it, it puts stripes there, but it also put in parentheses, the real meaning wounds. All right. It's wounds and wounds. All right. Now, so y'all so see what's happening here. This is a teaching channel. It may take us a while to get through this. Okay. Because um, y'all had all week to study it and you went over to other Sunday school teachers who was, who was teaching this, but I like to take my time because there's some, some words that maybe you miss. All right. When we look at the origins of words, then we can make a better understanding of what we were taught, especially through the uh, King James or any Elizabethan language of that time. So going down to Bible hub and look at uh, other trans uh, other, other commentators Let's see if we could uh, strip off this, no pun intended. All right, this is Isaiah 53 and 5. All right, let's see. Do I have any uh, stuff in here? Isaiah 53 and 5. Do I have any commentary? Okay, yes, I do. All right, I am gold. Blessed to you. My friends are here. Y'all, I needed y'all strength today. I, I, I was, I was kind of discouraged today. So y'all, you all who are here, thank you. Thank y'all for coming here. I, 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 I like to be as honest as possible. I, I was feeling discouraged today. Okay, so look at this. Barnes notes on the Bible. Now, let's go down and look at some of the key terms. Looks like I went through this already. And with his stripes margin, the word is bruised. Okay. If we consider stripes, every time I would see that when I was young, I would see in my in my in, I would envision a stripe on his side, a sh couple stripes on his sides, and so I would look at that as by his stripes we are healed. But I, that's the wrong vision. <laughs> Tiffany said, "Take your time." <laughs> That's the wrong vision by not just his stripes, but many of the wounds. So when you look at the stripe word in King James, it seems like it was only here and here, but he had wounds everywhere. Okay. He had wounds everywhere. Yes. All right. So let's go down here. The welts I am gold says, the word used here in Hebrew, tabura, means properly stripe, wheel. Uh, some, some may say whelps, bruises. That is the mark or print of blows on the skin. You see that? Uh, let's see if anything else is here that I need to, I need to see. They give me references here as a leopard, as spots, as a leopard. The proper idea uh, is the wheel or wound made by bruising. The mark designated by us when we speak of it is being black and blue. You get it now? He was beaten till he was black and blue. Mm -hmm. It is not a flesh wound. It does not draw blood, but the blood and other humors are collected under the skin. Y'all see that? Now it sounds different now. The obvious and natural idea conveyed by the word here is that the individual referred to would be subjected to some treatment that would cause such a whale, a wheel or stripe. That is that he would be beaten or scourged. How literally this was applicable to Jesus Christ. It is unnecessary to attempt to prove. 
It may be remarked here that this could not be more conjecture. How could Isaiah, uh, how could Isaiah, seven hundred years before it occurred, conjecture that the Messiah would be scorched and bruised? It is this particular level, uh, particularly of prediction, particularity. I'm I'm, I'm talking too fast. <laughs> Compared with the literal fulfillment. Now, when we go down here, let's look what healed means. Literally, it is healed to us or healing has happened to us. The healing referred to is. You see it? If you see it, say, I see it. (laughs) You see it, right? Just because this guy said it don't mean that it is true. Right. But. I'm going to lean on him and then I'm going to lean on a couple other guys and see what they got to say. All right. Because I'm going to bring in some other references. All right. So I'm going to spend a lot. I'm going to spend a lot of time on Isaiah 53. All right. So if you're in a hurry. Um, this is not your show today. So this is not your show. I'm going to spend a lot of time in the Old Testament. Is that okay? We'll get to the New Testament if there's time. All right. So, it is spiritual healing or healing from sin, pardon of sin, and restoration to the favor of God are not unfrequently represented as an act of healing. The figure is derived from the fact that awakened and convinced convicted sinners are often represented as crushed, broken, bruised by the weight of their transgression and the removal of the load of sin is represented as an act of healing. Y'all see that right there? Oh, it's beautiful. This is a beautiful poetic melody to my ear. You get it now? This parallelism, this structure that I have been teaching on patreon.com. I've been teaching a class and I'm truly, I took a little break, but I'll get back to it Monday on genres. And, and I was talked about Psalms. I talked about, um, poetry. I talked about, uh, exaggerated texts. Remember that you all that you decided not to go over to some of the bunkers did and, and took the test, but we talked about parallelisms and not contradicting the parallelisms of the text and making comparisons when you got one or two lines up here, space, then one or two lines down here, they, do they supposed to juxtapose each other? Are the first two lines supposed to agree and then the next two lines agree or what? All right, you got to go over there and figure it out. But that's what's happening here. This is a wonderful opera here. Uh, and then when we, when we go to... Um, First Peter uh, chapter two, then you will see that it is sounds so, so not natural. Let's go down here. Then here's what he said. Sin is not only a crime for which we were condemned to die and which Christ purchased for us to pardon up, but it is a disease. What is a disease? You all. Hmm which tends directly to the death of our what souls and which Christ provided for the cure of by his stripes. That is the sufferings he underwent. He purchased for us the spirit of grace to God of God to mortify our corruptions, which are the distempers of our what souls. Y'all see that? And to put our souls in a good state of health that they may be fit. It goes on and on. Again, the reason why I'm spending a lot of time on this is because typically when we read the scriptures, we tend to take a word that the, that the American English word has tainted and changed. Um, if you don't read the scriptures based off it, of its original meaning, then you're going to have a problem. And this is why these new translations have, have caused problems with us, like the Passion Bible and the, the new Gen Z Bible that I read the other day and what have you. So that's why. When you all were trying to interpret the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violence take it by force, you looked at the word violent as being something negative and war belligerent like warfare. All right. That is not what that violent mean. But if we the reason why, again, 
God is, an, is a terrible God. Is he not? He's terrible. But if your husband or your wife or your children said that you were terrible, then you would feel dismayed, you'd be discouraged, you might get angry. How dare you call me terrible? But God is terrible. <laughs> He's also all some, but not so much in the, in the, oh, you're so awesome. You're so sweet and awesome. No, he's all some. Now that right there could mean he's a judge. <laughs> you get it? So when we see words like, like uh, healing, we automatically think that it's talking about physical healing. But in this context, it is not. Hmm. I'll give you some more. Let's see what somebody else say. Uh, this was, who was this? Jameson? Who was this? This, is, this was Barnes Notes. Let's see what Jameson Fawcett, does he say anything? Uh, yep, look at that. Healed spiritually. Looks like to me, so far, 100% of these guys are lining up to what I'm saying. Some of these guys didn't. Okay, who is this? Matthew Poole's commentary, what did he say? With the stripes we are healed. By his sufferings we are saved from our sins and from the dreadful effort, uh, the effects of it thereof. Man, they, they, for the first time in a long time, they are all agreeing. Gill's expo exposition of the entire Bible, what they say down here. And with his stripes we were healed, or by his stripes are bruised, Properly, the black and uh, this is the same we read ab ab above. Sin is a disease belonging to all men, a natural, hereditary, nauseous and incurable one. But by the blood of Jesus of Christ, forgiving sin is, is a healing of this disease. Look at that. Have, have y'all changed your mind yet? <laughs> y'all ain't changed your mind yet? OK, yeah, there's always proof. There's always, there's always proof. Uh, who else? Who else? Who else? Who else? Who else? Cambridge pulpit. Mm -hmm. uh, this is Kale or Kiel. Uh, okay, let's see what he say here. We have um, in what follows and by his stripes, we have been healed. Shalom is defined as a condition of salvation through. I'm sorry, brought about by healing salvation. There it is. There it is. We were sick unto death because of what? Our sins. There it is. All right. I believe in line upon line, precept upon precept as well. So let's go to, to Psalms 41 and 41 and 4 and see why did they put that there? Psalms 41 and 4. Ah. Yeah. Okay, what did it say? Uh, I said, oh, uh, Lord, be merciful unto me. My uh, Heal my soul, for I have sinned. You see that? Why would he put heal here and then say so? Hmm. I don't even think I need to break this down. Heal my soul. Uh, that's kind of self-explanatory. Okay. That's, that's self-explanatory. I see why they did that. So let's, let's find another one. Uh, let's find another one in the Old Testament. Y'all still with me, right? You still with me? PC, are you with me? PC. GP, are you with me? Here's one. Psalm 6. It says Psalm 6 and 2 is another reference. Mm -hmm. Psalm 6 and 2 is another reference. Let's find it. Psalm 6 2. Oh, here, here it is. This one might be difficult, you all. Here it is. King James. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak, O Lord. Heal me, for my bones are vexed. Uh oh. Heal me, for my bones. I vexed. 
Guess what? Here's another case where he's not talking about physical, even though he said bones. And if I was standing in front of you all in the church, a mixed multitude, they would throw stones at me for saying that. But you can't make blanket statements without doing the research. While in, at Moody Bible Institute, and I have a class uh, called Research Writing, and the other one called The Story and Structure of the Bible, we have to defend our answers. And how do we do it? Well, we have to do it a couple ways. First of all, your testimony does not always, does not always fit in your defense. Okay? It doesn't always fit in your defense because many of us operate through our emotions. This is why when you get in church, you see a lot of emotions and people leave there dumber <laughs> than they did when they went in there because you see a lot of emotion and no concrete meat. This is why lately a lot of people have been saying, can you help me find a church in my town? Well, I'm not familiar with your town. Uh, but the fact that people keep asking me that tells me that the gospel of Jesus Christ is not really being preached in a lot of our churches today. That's why a lot of people don't even go to brick and mortars anymore. They find true word of God for watching a guy online or a gal online because a lot of women are great teachers. So while I'm taking these, uh, um, going through these classes at Moody, we can't even go to Wikipedia to find our source. Can y'all tell me why they frowned upon Wikipedia? That's not a good source. Number two, uh, there are other sites on Google that you may find the answer, but those websites are not a good source because many of them are filled with ads, bombarded with ads, and any viable, credible scholastic academic site would not be bombarding you with a whole bunch of ads and commercials. They wouldn't do it. So that's another hint. <laughs> so the best resources are those that are peered reviewed, tested, tried, and trued. You understand? And so these scholars that I've been reading are peer reviewed. And many of them are allowed inside of uh, academia because they've been around forever. So time has a lot to do with it. Um, and then there's two type, there's two different types of resources. That is, that's the, we may call direct and indirect. All right. Uh, those that were there, those who were writing and they were witnessing in it, and those who are what's called secondary. Secondary are those who are writing about a historical thing that happened, but you wasn't there. You heard from somebody who heard from somebody. Primary research is when you were there and you witnessed it yourself. Some primary resources uh, can be viable or used or accredited even though the person wasn't there, but it's, it's because it's only been a few years since that event had happened and the person don't really have to be there, but it's still fresh and new. So that person is a primary resource, but the secondary person is uh, someone who heard from, from someone who heard and they wrote about an event that they read when they was a child, secondary, you understand? But at least secondary and primary resources are okay to be used in academia, it's just that the secondary resources must be checked, double checked, and triple checked by what? Finding the primary source. So I said all of that to say that it's, it is easy for me to say that this scripture here healed me for my bones of vex is not physical, is easy. But after I do the research, then I can tell you by the origins or etymology that 
maybe he does or does not mean. Now, pulpit, after I've done my research, I think that pulpit say something. I think pulpit was the only one. I think, was it here? Uh, heal me. Uh, okay, yeah. Bodily ailments seem certainly to be implied, but it is that sort of bodily ailment which is often produced by what? Mental distress. A general languor. Weariness and distaste for exertion. Hmm. Big words, y'all. Big words, big words. So let's see, let's go and find some more here. This is Psalm 62. Psalm 62. Let's go and find some more. All right. Here we are. Let's dive deeper into this. Y'all sit with me, right? Did y'all leave yet? I don't want y'all to leave. Uh, stay with me. I'm lonely. And <laughs> stay with me. I'm lonely. David Weaver, I, I bless you, man. I bless you, sir. Psalm 62, uh, right here. O Lord, heal me. This language, which would be properly applied to a case of sickness, and therefore it is most natural to interpret it in the sense in this place. Look at this. Now, if you just read that, you would say, Walter, you're wrong. Look what he says here. He said it, it is most natural to interpret it in this sense. What sense? This language would be properly applied to the case of sickness. Okay. But as he continues, he then brings up vexed. The word vexed we now commonly apply to mental trouble and especially the lighter sort of mental trouble to irritate, to make angry by little provocations to harass. It is used here, however, as is common in scripture in reference to torment or anguish. The bones are the strength and framework of the body. Yes. And the psalmist means here to say that the very source of his strength was gone. That, that which supports him was prostrated that his disease and sorrow had penetrated the most firm parts of his body. Okay. Language is often used in the scripture also as if the bones actually suffered pain. Bones do not suffer pain. We think it does because you say, I broke my bones, my, my, oh my, to the point where we often say, my bones hurt. Well, no, your bones don't hurt. You can't. Feel your bones hurting. What you're feeling is, <laughs> can y'all tell me what you're really feeling? <laughs> I know, I know, I know. It's ridiculous, isn't it? I know it's ridiculous. Thank you, Candy. It's your nerve that's wrapped around them bones that hurt. You get it? The sinews. Yeah, y'all got it. So now let's read this again. Your muscles hurt. So language is often used in the scripture also as if the bones actually suffered pain, though it is now known that the bones as such are incapable of pain. And in the same manner, also language is often used, uh, though that use of the word is not found in the scripture, as if the marrow of the bones were especially sensitive, like a nerve, in accordance with what is common and popular belief, though it is now known that the marrow of the bone is entirely insensitive to suffering. Uh-oh, you see what they're doing here? The design of the psalmist here is to say that he was crushed and afflicted in every part of his frame. Now y'all get it? Uh, let's see. See if I can find somebody else. Let's see what Gibbs Expository say. <laughs> y'all still with me, right? I'm gonna keep asking y'all because I'm lonely. I just need I just need some company. Y'all come y'all need some tea? I didn't make any tea for you. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to go down in the piggly wiggly and get y'all some tea. So right here. For bones are vexed with strong pain, meaning his body as kimchi 
and Aben Ezra observed because they, these are the foundations of the body and the more principal part of it. And this may be understood of his grief, his grief. Where's my pen stuff? Come on, pen stuff. Where you go? Uh, of his grief and trouble of heart for his sins and transgressions, which is sometimes expressed by bones being broke and by there being no rest in them. You see that now? Sins and transgressions. So now when you read it, you see that he feels pain in his bones, not because his bones were broken. How many expressions have you heard? My tired bones. Your soul is tired. I have been saying that for many years until the Lord just gave me a, a boost of energy. I've been saying for many years that my whole soul is tired. All right. So let's see. Then they reference Psalms 103. All right, I'll give you one more. Give you one more, one more, one more, one more. <clears throat> King James says here, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. Uh-oh. There's another one, y'all. If I told y'all he's not talking about physical ailments and diseases like cancer, you would be upset with me, wouldn't you? You would, wouldn't you? <laughs> I know you would. You you would be so upset with me. I, I'm upset with myself. I'm, I am. I, I'm, I'm upset with myself. All right, let's see if we can find some help here. Psalms 103. Psalms 103. Okay, are y'all ready for this? Huh? Y'all ready for this? <laughs> Renee said, the things I'm learning. All right, here's another one. Again, peered, reviewed. If you got the majority of the scholars saying, no, this is what it is, then you, and then you disagree with what the scholars are saying, and then everyone who's res respected in this authority space, then your answer, if it's juxtaposes theirs, is private interpretation. Why? Many of us are guilty of private interpretation. I was all my life thinking that must be what it says, but you cannot read something in the English today or in the Elizabethan of yesteryear and then apply it to today, which is much worse, and think you got the whole story without going back much further to its origins or as close to the primary resource as possible, which were people who were there who was literally speaking the language. And that is the problem with King James, that by the time they got it, they went from the Texas Receptus and then they put those 40, 42 men together and then they began to bring stuff over. Things got lost in translation. So they used the language of that day because you, you can only translate compared to where you are today. How smart you are today will determine the level of your ability to translate and to interpret as well. So we, we, our understanding was only so far because we did not veer outside the King James Bible, which is the only translation we had when we were coming up. And you didn't go back and find out where did King James get its resources. Go back and find the, the, the receptus. Hmm? Go back and find an earlier manuscript. And then with the knowledge we have now, you'd be able to read it and then go to its original language, which may be the Old Testament is Hebrew, get you a strong concordance, and then you can see the Hebrew or, uh, and the uh, New Testament being Greek, and then once you see the words, then you'll say, oh, that's what he's saying, and then learn a lesson on literature, the, uh, the spirit behind, or the spirit and the emotion behind that language of that time. We the people in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, so, I, I, it's been so long. <laughs> Provide for the common defense, provoke 
the general welfare, security, blessings, liberty to ourselves, not posterity. Do a day in the style of just constitution. It goes on and on. All right. Well, the constitution sounds beautifully poetic today. Back then, it 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 meant something different. Based the spirit behind that that document right there said something based off of what those founders as far as they could go before they hit a brick wall of knowledge. So the Second Amendment says what? Well, what kind of weaponry did they have back then? They could not even fathom atomic warfare. <laughs> Y'all understand? Uh, hey, Slender, we can use as much space as we want, but God has the final say in the matter of healing. It may be when we get to Yes. Yes, I agree with that. Wholeheartedly, I agree with that. Don't worry, I'm going to fix all of this. I'm going to fix all of this. I'm going to fix all this for those of you who are still disagreeing. You're talking about the challenge of the vernacular. Yes, region, country. Yes, language of the people of the time versus, yes, 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 James Foster. I knew you was going to come and save me. God saved me, and then James saved me tonight. <laughs> I got a double blessing. Okay, so... Uh, complete physical healing is guaranteed in heaven, but the spiritual healing is yes, 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 yeah. I love y'all. Y'all are helping me here <laughs> because again, I have to go through this. So now let's see what it says here. The last one I gave you, Psalms 103 and 3. Ellicott says, diseases here, chiefly in a moral sense. As the parallelism iniquity shows, even if the text, I'm sorry, oops, <laughs> even if the next verse taken literally implies an allusion to physical suffering as well. Do y'all see what's happening here? <laughs> Joyce said, fix it all, <laughs> fix it. <with> you. <laughs> y'all see what's happening here? He highlighted diseases and says, chiefly in a moral sense, parallelism, iniquity shows even if the next verse taken literally implies an illusion to physical. It's still chiefly the disease is moral. Man, I, I, I keep getting myself in trouble. Trouble, trouble. Matthew says, spiritual diseases, lusts, corruptions, which he subdues and purges out by his grace, as the phrase is used. And he gives, look at that. Look what popped up right there. Are y'all upset with me? Hmm? Hmm? I'm, I'm just a messenger. Gills, what they say. Who healeth all diseases, not bodily ones, though the Lord is the physical of the bodies as well as the soul of men and sometimes heals the diseases of soul and body at once, as in the case of the paralytic man in the gospel. But spiritual diseases or soul maladies are here what meant. Mm. <laughs> Charlene said, we are okay. We are not upset. I thought you said we are upset. The same with iniquities. In the preceding clause, sin is a natural, hereditary, epidemical, nauseous, and mortal disease. And there are many of them, a complication of them in men, which God only can cure. And he heals them by his word, by means of his gospel, preaching peace, pardon, righteousness. It goes on and on. This is a great Break down Mr. Gills. That was good, man. What does Cambridge say? Now, you know, if it say Cambridge, you know it's got to be good. The psalmist may have had in mind, I am Jehovah that healeth thee, where the, where the somewhat rare word for rare word for diseases is used of the judgments with which the land is to be punished for Israel's what? sins the word need not be limited to bodily sickness you see that but may include all suffering i see this is where he fixed it for you all <laughs> he fixed it 
The removal of punishment of sin is the proof of his forgiveness. Look at that. Y'all still here, right? Y'all, y'all, y'all here, right? So if, if you're sick in your body, you are to go to the elders and they shall lay hands on you. And the prayers of the saints will heal you. And can y'all tell me what else that verse says will happen? And if there be what? Hmm. Hmm. Can you tell me? How many smart Christians we got out there? Not, not, not Corey Minor, not Corey Minor. How many, how many smart Christians we got out there? Huh? And if there be any what? Hmm? Okay. And he sin. Then what? If there be any sin, then what? This is how we fix this. Thank you, Jerome, pastor, prophet. It shall be forgiven you. Okay, now I got another problem. <laughs> I got another problem. So if I'm sick in my body, I go to the elders and they heal me, will my sins automatically be forgiven? And I'm done. I don't have to ask God for forgiveness? Hmm? Huh? Huh? Because look what it says about the husband and wife, one not being saved, the other one being saved, and then there's children. It says that the sanctified spouse can cause the the uh the unsaved spouse to be saved and then the children shall be what can you tell me what it says after that and I, I only read the bible one time so i don't really know hmm? so are these children automatically without any personal repentance of themselves be I'm looking for the word, y'all. I want you to put it there. Thank you, Shirley. <laughs> Holy. <laughs> Sanctified. Huh? Hmm? Are the children automatically sanctified? How much trouble am I in, y'all? <laughs> How much trouble am I? Hmm? Oh, 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 Renee said, go and sin no more. Command follow. Command followed the healing. Renee? Ooh. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Okay, okay. All right, that's, that's it. That's just Renee. That's, anybody else? It is a covering until they come into the, oh, candy. Okay. Is it always the case, though? Would that not be the same as the train? Tra yeah, okay, Renee. It's good. I think I found next month's um, private Zoom session. <laughs> okay, Archer, yes, according to scripture. So the kids are automatically covered. No matter what. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> I need to do a show on that one. All right, so now you got the answers. Bruised for our iniquity, the chest type of the peace will upon him by his stripes. We are sin sick. So we are healed because we are sin sick. But that word healed is in Hebrew and Greek, and it means dual. It means natural and physical. Y'all get it? It's both. But in context, Isaiah is speaking about spiritual healing. All right? So let's see. So now we need to go... Uh, to Peter. Do I have it here? And see what they say. First Peter 2. First Peter 2. Do I have it? Ah, I don't have it on here. First, let me read it. Let me read it. Let me read it here on my phone. King James says, who his own self bore our sins. Now, this is why context is very important. King James, 1 Peter chapter 2, started the, yeah, King, yeah, 23rd, 24th. Who his own self bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins 
should live unto righteousness. Why? Because by whose stripes you were healed. Did you see that? You heard it? Notice everything that led up to the by his stripes. He was talking about sin. He wasn't talking about broken bones, cancer, um, or high blood, low blood, no blood at all. <laughs> no. He, he was talking about sins. His own self bore our sins in his own body. Jesus, Jesus wasn't sick. Y'all know that, right? That we being dead to sins. You got it now, Patricia? So now Isaiah 53 comes alive. Bruised for our iniquities. Iniquity is in there. The chastisement of our peace were upon him and by his stripes were healed. You get it? All right. So now that I spent two hours on that, I got to now go to the last ch uh, chapter, Luke chapter 24. Where is it? Where is Luke chapter 24? Do I even have it? I know I got it somewhere around here. Where is Luke? Here it is. I found it, y'all. I know y'all was concerned. <laughs> okay. Um... You can't, you just can't start at the 25th verse without starting up here to, to walk to Emmaus. You just can't do it. That same day, two of Jesus' followers were walking in the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. And as they walked along, they were talking about everything that happened. As they talked and discussed everything, these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and became walking with them. Um, but God kept them from recognizing him. God kept them. So the disciples, in, nor did the women remember that Jesus said he was going to die. Why? Because we believe that God did the same thing there. What are you discussing so intently as he walked alone? They stopped short sadness, written across their faces. Then one of the, uh, them, Cleopas, replied, you know, you must be the only person in Jerusalem. Who, you've been living under a rock. So Jesus asked, what you talking about? The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, you know, they said he was a prophet uh, who did powerful miracles and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leaders, our, our leading priests and other religious leaders handled, handed him over to be condemned to death and they crucified him. We had hoped he was the Messiah. Look at that. Who had come to rescue Israel. This all happened three years. We hope, but that, what, that didn't happen. The man died. Then some women from our group of his followers were at his tomb early that morning and they came back with an amazing report. They said his body was missing and they had seen angels who told them Jesus was alive and some of our men ran to see him. And sure enough, his body was gone, just as the women said. All right. Then Jesus said, you foolish people. Now, you got the code right here, though. Look at this. We have hoped. We had hoped. They still was talking that way. We had hoped he was the Messiah. Even though he, they gave him that report here, they still was hoping. But then the body was gone, and they might have thought that somebody stole the body, but he didn't rise. This is what they believe. So, you fools, you find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in, in, uh, in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering? Huh? Come on, man. Didn't you not read? Then Jesus took them through the, the writing of Moses. I wonder why he took them through those writings. Can y'all tell me why? Why would Jesus take them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets? Hmm? What? Were they Gentiles? Hmm? <laughs> Explaining from all the scriptures that the things concerning himself. By the time they were nearing Emmaus and the end of the journey, Jesus acted as if uh, he was going on. But they begged him, stay the night with us since it's getting late. So he went home with, ooh, can you imagine Jesus going home with them, with y'all? Come home, Jesus, come home. Well, guess what? He, ne he, ne he never sleeps. Mm. As they sat down to eat, he took the bread and blessed it. Looked like he's doing another Lord's Supper, huh? Then he broke it and gave it to them. Suddenly, their eyes were open. 
I wonder why. The bread. Why? Because Jesus is the bread of life. Something was in the bread. Their eyes were open and they recognized him. And at that moment, he disappeared. Why? Because God had put blinders on them. Okay. Right up in, right up in here. God did it. It's up in here. They didn't recognize him. Why? Because God kept it from them. And then God sent an elixir, a healing agent, and the bread, and it opened up their eyes and understanding. Then they saw him. Mm, mm, mm. They said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? And within the hour, uh, they were on their way back to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 disciples and others who had gathered with them who said, the Lord has risen. He appeared to Peter. Last and certainly, certainly not least, 44, when I was with you, then he said, I told you that everything written about me in the, new, in the law of Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened his, their minds to understand the scripture right there. Right there, y'all. Then he opened their minds to understand the scripture. My God today. That's where it all began, right there. Those disciples became apostles, right there. And the greatest understanding of the scriptures was given to them at that moment. You may have never seen this before, but you see it now. There is a time in your life, you may be able to pinpoint it somewhere where you know that wisdom overtook you at that moment. Maybe it was that day, that hour, that week. It overtook you and your whole life changed at that moment. Knowledge was poured into you. I remember when it happened to me. I often tell the bunkers that I was on the back porch as a young pre-teenager. My mama was drinking RC Cola with a 13-inch black and white television watching As the World Turns and General Hospital. Well, I don't think there was a General Hospital. Maybe, maybe it was. I, I, I can't. I can't remember. All right. Uh, and and the, the young and, and the restless. She was sitting there, and I'm on the back porch with my Bible, preteen, and I opened it up, and there I was reading the story of Solomon and God's conversation, and asking God pour wisdom into me. I might have been 13. I don't know. Pour wisdom into me, God. Because one day I'm going to need it. Not knowing that one day I would be turning on my computer and people from around the world would listen to this tall, six feet, big nose, big head, <laughs> very slim, brown eyes, <laughs> dude, teach the gospel of Jesus Christ and affect many lives. Why? Because right here. Then he opened their minds to understand the scripture. Whew. The scale fell off their eyes, Joyce. That's it. Notice when Peter and, and John and them was, went back and began to talk to those men. They healed a man, a blind man. And then they went back and they were talking to the scholars, as the, the scribes and, and the high priests and, all, and, and Caiaphas and all those folks. And then notice what those men, those, uh, those, those high and mighty Pharisees and Sadducees said to those men. They said, we can tell that they had been with the Lord. Mm. Can the world see you and they can determine that you've been with the Lord? Hmm? When you open up your mouth, what comes out of it? Huh? And can they tell? I can tell. You've been with the Lord. Hmm? Look at this. And then the Holy Spirit fell on, on Pete and John. Boldness came over them. And they began to preach the gospel. And he said, yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die, rise from the dead on the third day. 
it was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. This just continues, y'all, my point. You are witnesses of all these things. There is forgiveness. And now I will send the Holy Spirit just as my father promised. But stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. Whew. Then the Holy Spirit came. Jesus blew on them, said, now wait and tarry here. Occupy until I come. They did. He ascended. They went to the upper room. The Spirit of God fell on those people. The young men saw vision. The old men saw saw dreams, your the children, your women and the, the boys and girls, women and men will prophesy. <sighs> and just as the prophet Noel, Joel, not Noel, <laughs> Joel said it. So it, it came at that moment. Peter preached the gospel a long one at that because he was long winded like I am. Your sins have been forgiven you. And people are going to go back and try and bring up your sins, your past sins. They're going to try to bring it up. Ask me how I know. Ask me how I know. People have been trying to swim in my toilet for many months now, thinking that what they've been seeing is stuff that I'm doing today and currently. They think that I'm still in that sin because some woman is trying to take me down because I would not settle with her or whoever. So they're trying to take my name down because of a scorned. But the Lord told me, I've got a hedge around you. I'm protecting you. Don't you worry about these people. And those people who are coming to you diving in that toilet, let them dive in the toilet. You keep preaching the gospel. Don't let these distractions come your way. Right, brothers, I'm talking to you especially. Don't let those distractions and those, those people coming to you with some stuff that you know that was settled on the cross. Don't worry about it. You are human. You got flesh, so you're still going to get feel dismayed and weak. Trust me. I had a weak moment even today. I had a weak moment. I felt almost a sense of defeat but it only lasts for just a few minutes. So there's strength, you all. There's strength. I was with my brothers today, Larry and Rodney, and we were talking. Uh, I was going to bring it up tomorrow, but I, I'll talk about it now. They were, we were talking. We were talking about R. Kelly. He was robbed to us. I was, I was supposed to be the keyboard player for public uh, announcement, which was the group that R. Kelly was in before he became R. Kelly. I knew all those guys, and we, I would play the, the Casio in, in the projects, and we, we would walk up and down the high school and sing and pick up girls. And my father told me, walk away from that. And we would go to the church. Uh, R. Kelly's church was across the street from my house. Uh, his pastor was a woman pastor by the name of Reb, Pastor Reb. Whenever you would see him winning Grammys or what have you, that woman that you saw, that wasn't his mama, that was his pastor. Mm-hmm. And said that was his pastor. And the building is up the street and it, it's been it's burned down now. I can go to Google Maps and show you what it used to look like. And I would walk in there and, and R. Kelly would be on the altar crying out to the Lord, God, save me. God, help me. Save me. God, save me. I need you. I need you. I knew that he was struggling with something. Good and evil was right there present. And he was trying to shake whatever this thing was. That was me. That was me. The life of David. That was me. I love David, but I love more so the relationship that David had with God the Father. Because out of all of the sins that David committed, that boy died and God still called him the apple of his eye. Ain't that about nothing. He said, he is a man after my own heart. After he did all he did. And God reminded me, 
after all the stuff you did, I'm still coming after you. That song y'all sing, I'm chasing after you. No, you're not. He's always chasing us. <laughs> so my brother Larry was, well, he was talking about how he, R. Kelly was, he was at, they were at the studio. My family's always been in the music business. We've been, you know, rubbing shoulders with, with many of the greats, whether secular or gospel. It didn't matter to us. They were, they were just normal people to us. It was nothing to see Kanye West sitting at a McDonald's, you know, up, up the street here. He was just Kanye. It's like Rob. Rob still loved McDonald's he, before he went to jail. It was nothing to see these guys, Oprah, you know, it was nothing to see these people. They were just Chicagoans to us. All right. And Robert was playing the piano. My brother was standing there on the bass. He was on the bass and they were practicing. And Rob started singing a gospel song and tears rolled down his eyes. And she, she just sang it. And my brother said today, men don't do that in front of men if there was no sincerity there. Robert wanted God so bad. He wanted God so bad, but those demons were ever present and he allowed those demons in. The problem was there was always yes men around Robert, always. And no one could really tell him or heal him, help him heal. You understand? They couldn't do it. So it's difficult to have these people around you. There was, there was uh, someone who, after I did the SDA show, the Seventh Day Adventist show, this person went into the, into the uh, YouTube comment section. It's not there anymore. At least I didn't see it. And they gave a whole, tried to give a history of me and sh uh, sending uh, naked pictures to one of the bunkers. Who comes here? Shows up. Okay, in the comment section. And we back and forth sending naked pictures and all this stuff. And y'all know I addressed this last month. Was it last month or a month and a half ago? Y'all remember that show? Remember that show I did? I addressed all that. But there are people who are still diving in my toilet. You see, that case right there was not going in my, diving in my toilet because that case that this person put on the comment section never happened. There are people who want to destroy you, all right? And they, 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 they go up to a platform that I set up called Patreon, and they're in the chat over there trying to destroy my name on Patreon, <laughs> a place where we all go to have fun and enjoy teachings, what have you. And they go over there and they're talking about some stuff about me and this, this young lady. And it's, it's ridiculous. And the Lord says, I got you covered. Don't you worry about that stuff. I got you covered. I got you covered. I got you covered. But God, I'm, I'm human. Some of these people literally believe in this stuff. Got you covered. But what they're doing is they're going even further back in my, in my past and they're bringing up stuff that's in the toilet. Do you understand? So I called Corey Minor today. I called Corey Minor. Why? Because every man that has some kind of influence like myself, need to call cross and not down. You need to call crossway or call upwards. That may not make any sense to you all, but I needed somebody who can relate. Who can relate. So I called Corey, and he and I talked. He said, I'm watching the game right now. You got a few minutes. I said, it's only going to, I said, Corey, I need you to encourage me in the Lord. And he stopped everything. He didn't care about no game. He didn't care about his family. He forsake everybody. And Corey Miner from the Smart Christian Channel poured into me today. And he talked about his, his prison time, which was only four years ago. When I was burying my mother in 2019, yeah, I'm not buffering anymore over here, so I'm hope I'm sorry you all were buffering. When I buried my mother in 2019, Corey was still in prison. That's how fresh it was. He gets out of prison, and he's on fire from the Lord. 
and men was trying to bring up his prison time. Y'all know his story. Let me show y'all something. Here's one of my shirts. This shirt here is, was the only shirt that, that I had when I was in jail, come out of jail. I came out of jail with only the clothes that they had arrested me in. And by the time I got, got out of jail, I had nothing. I had lost everything. So it was a hot summer day, it was almost fall. No, it was summer. And I had no, there was no Uber, there was no Lyft. I couldn't afford no cab, I had no money. And I had to walk for miles in the hot sun. I remember getting, because I was getting ready to faint, I had no water. And I walked to Walmart and I walked in there uh, and I had just enough money for a shirt. Because when they arrested me, they had to give me my wallet back. And in my wallet, I always keep a couple of dollars in the wallet. And I opened it up, I said, oh, there's a couple of dollars in here. And I bought this shirt. I'll never throw this shirt out. This shirt right here is a reminder of me being behind bars. Restricted. You couldn't almost you couldn't even breathe without asking for permission. Take it off over here, boss. Go ahead, boy. And this shirt right here. And I remember getting on the I called a friend to lend me a money for a Greyhound bus ticket. And I got on the bus, no jacket, and I got on the bus, and the bus driver turned the air on North Pole. And for, I would say, a good 15 hours or so, I froze on that bus with just this shirt. And I, until my bones started to hurt. You ever been cold to where your bones is hurting? Now I'm talking physical, y'all. And that's the shirt here. I'll never, I'll never get rid of it. So Corey and I was talking about this. I said, Corey, how often do people go into your toilet and dig in to your mess? He said, they do it all the time. He said, you remember Rachel? <laughs> remember Rachel? I said, yeah, I remember Rachel. He said, he said uh, uh, it's amazing how people will try to expose you and they never do that for themselves. Mm -hmm. They never do that. They never expose themselves. Never, never. As if they were born, saved, sanctified, and Holy Ghost filled. They never do it. But they're going to find something on you. And then here's the thing. I'm not going to talk. I'm not going to say who this person is. But here's the thing about this person who put this on, on my wall. This person was a Seventh-day Adventist. And once I did that show against the Seventh-day Adventists, not all of the, the Seventh-day Adventists, remember I opened up that show and said they all are not like that. So apparently this person was like the second half of who I was talking about. This person decided to expose all of the dirt that they heard about me in one of the bunkers here while well, us getting naked and taking pictures of <laughs> each other and what have you. They decided to expose all that. They was holding on to that only because I exposed the SDA. Here's my thing. If you love the saints, if you love me, if you love God that much that you say you do, would you hold on to toilet water until you have an opportunity to throw it back into somebody's face because they offended you. Hmm? How many of you would do that? You know that Sheila Mahoney is in sin. 
and you won't even call them, won't text them, won't inbox them, but you holding on to her toilet water, waiting for the opportunity. How many of you know people who do that? It doesn't matter if it was true or not. They're going to do it. And then they say they love God. And they continue to watch my show. Every day, faithfully, they come and watch the Sir Walter Jones show. That person in the comment section said, I watch your show all the time. I know they did because they were putting my catchphrases in the comment section, holding on the toilet water until I spoke against the SDA. And then they finally came out and said, see, here's all these things about you that I know. And I said, God, this is amazing. And I said, God, thank you. Thank you, God. <laughs> so the people who will smell the toilet water or the ones who reached out to me and says, brother, I'm praying for you. Brother, I'm covering you. Brother, I'm protecting you. Brother, beware. Those were the ones who showed their love, their love to me. You understand? So I didn't plan to go this way, but something kicked it off. <laughs> something kicked it off. Our Kelly was somebody I prayed for all the time because I knew him personally. I walked those, those, those high school halls with that portable Casio keyboard, and he was crooning, and he had bald head and he was croon, crooning up and down those halls and those girls would go crazy and crying out to the Lord, God save me. And I would see that and I would see R. Kelly crying out to the Lord and nobody could help him. See, because by the time he got to a certain place, I couldn't even call him anymore. I couldn't stop by the house. I couldn't. He was too high. I couldn't. Even though he lived here, I just couldn't. And nobody, not even the saints that I know, was strong enough to grab our Kelly and, and, and save him. Meaning, you know what I mean when I say save him. I couldn't do it. And my brother and I were sitting there talking in the parking lot and says, talked about how these men struggle in their flesh and they just need somebody to help them, a brother to reach down. But these deacons are too busy sitting on the benches smoking their cigarettes, cussing at folks and trying to get the pastor to do whatever they're bidding or they fire him, and that's all they do. And these ministers, all they want is a license. They want to be a bishop and apostle. They, they want to be prophets, and they, they want to be presiding bishops and stuff like that. But they're not doing nothing for those men who are crying in their flesh, God, please help me. Help me, help me. I don't want this life. I hate this life. R. Kelly hated his life. He hated it. And he represents a whole lot of men that are sitting in your pulpits. They are elders and ministers, and they are your pastors. And they can't tell y'all what's going on in their lives. And they're being tormented in their bodies because the church, you see, R. Kelly made enough money to pay off folks. And there are people in your churches that are so popular, you can't sit them down anymore. I did that show yesterday, was it? Day before yesterday? You can't sit them down. It's too, they're too high now. The banks in America were too big to fail during the Obama administration. He didn't do it. He, he, he what, what you call it, when you inherit. He inherited that problem, but they couldn't shut the banks down. They couldn't fire people. They couldn't. They, could. they had to save the banks because it was too big to fail. Our Kelly and these men was, was just too big, too big. So I still pray for R. Kelly because he's still alive. So when you find people who are digging in your toilet, you just say, well, God, I, th this is supposed to happen because to whom much is given, much is required. And let me say this last thing to you all about toilets. And I told this story before. Uh, the brother on the show happened, Moody Bible Institute, Pastor 
He's a local pastor here that he would air on Moody Bible Institute at night times. At night time, I forgot his name. Maybe one of y'all know who he is. He talked about how he went to a, re- a, a, a restaurant, high-class restaurant, and he went to relieve himself, and he went into the bathroom. And you could tell it was a high-class restaurant because there was an attendant there in the men's room. If you see an attendant in the men's room, you're paying a lot of money for that restaurant, for that food. And they, they typically have a tile. You know, they have to sit in that restroom, and no matter what's going on in that restroom, they got to sit through all that, smells and what have you. And so he said he went into the restroom and he went into the stall. He closed the stall behind him and he did his business. And he went to flush the toilet, but he couldn't flush the toilet because there was no handle. And he was looking for the handle (laughs) and there was no handle. And he kept looking. So he turned around and the attendant said, you, you, are you okay? He said, I'm trying to flush the toilet. And the attendant said, oh, all you have to do is turn around, walk away, and it will flush. <laughs> That's his name, James Ford. All you have to do is turn around, walk away, and it will flush. See, I'm also learning to cite your sources. I don't come up with these stories and then say, I, this is my story. No, this is James Ford's story. Cite your sources. He said, turn around, walk away, and flush. It will flush. He said, the problem is you're standing in front of the beam. <laughs> there is an invisible beam right there. And when you move out of the way of the beam, it will tell the toilet to flush. <laughs> he said, you're looking for the handle, but there is no handle. And he he turned around, he walked away and that toilet went whoosh. He said, wow. This was the time when they started, they had invented these new toilets that flush on their own. So, you know, this was some years ago. And the attendant gave him the towel and he dried his hands. And he walked, as he walked out, he said, that's the message. That's the message. And then he said, he, he brought that towards toxic relationships. <laughs> toxic relationships. You see, brothers or sisters, you're in a relationship that is so toxic. But what you're trying to do is handle it. <laughs> you're trying to handle it. But the problem is, you can't handle it. The problem is, you're standing in the way. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You're standing in the way. So all you have to do if you're in a toxic relationship is turn around, walk away, and it will flush. Let God help you walk away from that mess. So that's all it is, is mess. When you walk away, now you out of the way Let God handle it, and it will flush. God, thank you for your presence. Thank you for your blood. Thank you for the great flushing that I just heard all over the world. Thank you for your covering. Thank you for your protection. Thank you for these people who are here. What a blessing they are to the kingdom of God. Many of these people, I don't know them all, but they're not in swimming around the toilet, going around in the drain. These people are out there in the trenches, in the highways and the byways, and they're on the telephone, and they're in the inboxes and the emails, encouraging as many people as they can. They're putting up wonderful inspirational messages on their Facebook accounts and Twitter accounts and Instagrams. So God, thank you for these people. Every day they wake up trying to figure out how and what can they do to advance the kingdom. God, thank you for them. They ain't got time to swim around the toilet bowl. So we love you for what you're doing in their lives. Bless them, God. I'm not worried about me. You've already sealed me in your loving arms. I already know you've already told me that you got me all taken care of. That woman 
those people who are trying to destroy me and take me down because they're still in the toilet, God, save them, save them, save them, and heal them too. We have discovered today that the healing here can be both spiritual and physical, but contextually we see that sin is the sickness. These people who are trying to take me down are sick with sin. And they feel betrayed and they can't go to you. So they go to the people of God and the people of God are swimming. So God, I know that to whom much is given, much is required. And I do realize that persecution will come. So God, I thank you that it is good that I suffer for Christ's sake only though. But I do want you to save the unsaved. And those who are coming after me, God, teach them and show them the truth. And these people who are just listening to these toilet messages, clean them up, God, and, and close their gates, their ear gates and their eyes gates and their mouth gates and nose gates so they would not run into mischief. As you said in Psalms, Proverbs chapter 6, you said that those, those six or seven things that you considered an abomination, those who run into mischief and sow discord among the brothers, protect, heal, and deliver. We love you, God, and we give your name the praise in Jesus' name. Thank God. Amen. All right, y'all, I got to go. I feel better, so much better since I've laid my burdens down. I will figure out something inspiring to talk about tomorrow. Meanwhile, do me a favor, people. Turn around, walk away, and that mess will flush. i see you tomorrow. Meanwhile, go to patreon.com so watch the Jones show. I'll find out what's movie night. We'll find out a find a good movie for tomorrow night. And uh, watch, rinse, and repeat. Take care of yourselves. Sunday school is marching on. Oh, by the way, y'all, um, say a prayer for Amber Rogers. She has been sick for the past couple of days. Her back went out. Her bones are hurting, and she couldn't breathe yesterday or the day before yesterday. And y'all know Rogers does too much, does too much here for us. She she belongs to all of us, and there's a lot of things we can't do uh, without her help. All right, so y'all, will you please say a prayer for Amber Rogers that the Lord will heal whatever this ailment is going through her system, that God will regulate it so she can breathe, and so that uh, these things can be removed from her, so she can continue to help us get the gospel message of Jesus Christ out there. All right? So would you do that in the comments section? Just speak her name tonight, Amber Rogers, the clock keeper. All right, you all do that. God, thank you for her. Thank you for her strength. Thank you for the knowledge that you've given this woman. She don't have to do it, and she's doing it for free, helping all these people Stay focused on those scriptures and the word and the text of the day, the syllabus and what everything that we're doing. Thank you for her strength. We know that you're going to heal. I believe it. And these people who are in the comment section, they believe it too. I see them. I see them. I see them. Heal God. Deliver. As we know that you can. We love you, God. Do it in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Take care, y'all. Sunday school is marching on. When the storm clouds form, hear the cries of doom and gloom. Sunday school still marches. When the grass turn green and the flowers start to bloom, Sunday school still marches on, marches on, marches on. Sunday school still marches on, marches on, marches on. 
Sunday school still marches. Sunday school still marches. Sunday school still marches. Fellas, does it seem like you can't get a good woman? Ladies, wonder why you can't keep a man? Then read The Four Women That Men Desire, Volume 1, by Sir Walter Jones to figure out how to break the cycle. Go to Amazon.com to get your copy today. It's 10 p.m. Do you know where your children are?